Welcome everyone. I'm Susan Murray. I'm one of the partners at Trust Associates and on behalf of my colleagues at Trust Associates and Edison, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in what we hope will be a series of webinars focusing on topical issues affecting investment companies. Delighted to have three speakers joining us today. Um, we have Richard Ramsey. Richard's an experienced non-exec director and chair. His executive career was in corporate advisory work with Ivory and Syme, with Visa W and also in Telly. And he is currently chair of Seneca Global Income and Growth and the senior independent at JLEN Environmental Assets. Our second speaker will be Joe Winkley. Now, Joe is head of investment trusts at Winter Floods and I'm sure will be known to many of you. Joe's got over 15 years experience in investment funds and he advises over 52 investment companies. He's responsible for all the listed fund transactions at Winter Floods, and that includes, of course, IPOs, issuance, as well as corporate advisory work. And last but clearly not least, um, Andrew Summers, who's head of fund research at Investec Wealth and Investment. Andrew will be known to many of you, I'm sure. He heads up the team at um, Investec that covers collectives research, and today we'll focus on the investor perspective. Now, just before we start, can I just pass over a couple of um, housekeeping points? Each speaker is going to speak for around five to 10 minutes, leaving plenty of time for questions at the end of the session. And we're aiming for a finish time of around 10.45. If you'd like to ask questions, please use the Q&A tab that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll do our best to cover as many of them as we possibly can within the time frame. So we live in extraordinary times, a phrase that I'm sure we've got very used to hearing over the past few months. Our theme today wasn't therefore too much of a surprise and we've gone with COVID-19, the new challenges facing investment trusts. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, that's Richard, who will focus on a board perspective. Richard. Thank you, Susan. Um... I'd like to start, if I could, with a plug. Um, you might not be expecting that, but the AIC do have a very good center. It's called their COVID-19 Center. It lists, and it's a very good database of a lot of the issues that have come up. It covers 10 different topics, and I'll just run through the top five and the number of items in each to give you an idea of it if you haven't seen it. But it is well worth visiting. It's on the members part. The first one is corporate reporting. That has 30 items. Operational issues is next with 21. Market issues is 21, company meetings 13, and audit 12 items. So that, as I say, is a very good um, help center, really. What I'd like to focus on is a number of issues which I think are important to boards. One is business continuity. The next is what's happening to the portfolio. The third is shareholder engagement. The fourth is results and reporting. And then finally, having your meeting with your shareholders. Focusing on the first one, business continuity. I think we've had a very acid test of business continuity plans. Looking at the market, things seem to have worked well. There may be a lot of fast paddling below the water, but the world has gone on relatively well. Um, the investment process has clearly kept going. Administration and reporting has been happening, and the service providers have presumably been doing their, 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 their work. But we all need as a board to make sure that keeps happening. It's vital that the business continues operating. Um, there's also, I think, two other issues which are just interesting ones. The, the first is board communication. We've all been used to having board meetings, conference calls, um, email conversations, and so on. Those have all worked well. We're now in virtual meetings as we are today, and I think that brings a slightly different set of skills. I, I always think of the start of, have I got news for you, when they had to do a virtual show it worked quite well, but they were a little bit different from reality. And I think all boards have probably found as they've got into virtual meetings, they've developed the skills that make those work better. And the other important aspect of business continuity, I think, is we need to keep engaged with shareholders. You know, difficult things are happening in the market. Markets are volatile. We mustn't lose track of keeping in touch with our shareholders in the way we normally do. The next topic, I think, is, is what's been happening to the portfolio. Clearly, markets have been very volatile. If I look back two weeks, um, the, 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 the FTSE was up 6% in one, in one week, 6.7, in fact. The next week, it was down 5.9%. Uh, 
I think from a board's perspective, it's very important that you understand what is happening in the portfolio and how your investment manager is performing in the light of the mandate that they have. So keeping up to speed with that is important so you, you know what's happening. But it's not just the short term we have to think about. All portfolios have a longer term perspective and there's going to be some big challenges coming out in the future as economies settle down, the world changes. So I think you know, what you need to be doing is looking ahead and thinking with your investment manager about what those challenges are you preparing for them? For example, we might expect quite a lot of companies to be raising new capital. What are you going to do about that? Then there's the issue of um, important one for investors, important one for boards is what's happening to, to your income. What would you be able to do about dividends? That's very important to a number of shareholders. So again, you mustn't just look at the short term. You need to keep on focusing on the long term. And also, I think in these volatile times, it's important if you have any debt facilities to make sure you're aware of where your covenants are, how you stand in relation to those. And importantly, you know, when do your facilities renew? What are you doing to prepare for that? What do you think your bank is thinking? I don't, I've not heard of many problems on that front, but I think it's something which we all need to be aware of. I touched earlier on about the need for shareholder engagement. I think that's a critical thing for boards at the moment. It's all, there's always a need for clear communication on all matters. Um, but here, there are some special items, perhaps. Um, depending on the nature of your trust, you may have particular COVID issues. For example, at, at John Lang, at, at, at JLEN, um, we have solar farms, wind farms, anaerobic digestions. We have people in the field. We have to think about what's happening on, on that. Are they able to work? We put out a suitable announcement to the market to let them know that's all under control. So I think you have to think about those things. Um, we all have a process, no doubt, of regular fact sheets. I think it's worth thinking again about whether there's merit in having any market updates in between those monthly fact sheets. Certainly at Seneca, we felt that's a useful thing. We put into into month market reviews up on our website for shareholders to understand what the manager's doing in, in these times when markets are down 23%, up 20 odd percent, it's, it's all interesting. And then finally, there's also um, the important point, I think, of making sure that your shareholders do know, once you have a plan, what your thinking is on dividends. The dividends are vital. Investment trusts have made a big feature of how dividends are important, how they manage them, how they use reserves. So I think, again, this is an area which particularly now, when we look ahead and uh, we see dividends being cut all over the place, that, that what you think is happening on that front, as far as your shareholders are concerned, is important. Um, I think the other important thing is you need to keep your regular flow of communication going. And there's nothing, I think, worse at the far end if you're expecting a communication not to get it. If, if periodically the investment manager is in touch with you, if he ceases to be in touch, I'm sure, and Andrew perhaps will talk about this, but you might start to worry a little bit. You'll say, what's happening? So I think keeping those disciplines going is important in these markets. Uh, I come on then to results and reporting. Um, I think there's two aspects here, which I'm sure you have already focused on, but there's the, the first one is, there's clearly more risks around. So what you say about risks, how you describe them in your report and accounts, is more important. You're going to have to talk about COVID. That's going to be an addition to your risk register. Um, and you're going to have to do a lot more work, I can assure you, on your going concern statement. Your auditor has been instructed to look carefully at that. And then there's the long-term viability statement as well. All those will uh, require more work. I think the other thing, which I'm sure, again, you have already experienced is whilst work is happening whilst things are slowing on they all take a bit longer and so when you're thinking about timetabling you should plan to have some suitable slack in it to allow for that um, you maybe for example have to deal with the fca in some way or other again they are very busy i can i can assure you that having had some experience of that recently and so um, you you need just to focus on having that flexibility in your time scale and finally, we, we move on to how are you going to have your annual general meeting? 
Um, you'll all be well aware that with the social distancing rules, even as, as they are now relaxed, um, we can't have uh, the traditional annual general meeting. We can't all be in that room together. Some of you may have a lot of shareholders, some of you may not have so many, but you won't be able to hold your AGM in the traditional way. There seem to be um, three main routes that people are going down. One is extending the date and hoping that by the time they uh, get to needing to have an AGM, the rules will have changed so they can have it. A popular one is to encourage voting by proxy with normally an addition that you will say that um, uh, you will take shareholders' questions, send them into the company secretary, and you'll answer them on the website at or after the meeting. Um, at Seneca, we're actually planning also to put up after the meeting, because we normally have it at our general meetings, a presentation by the manager. So that's another little twist that may add a bit more to your communication, which is important in these markets. And finally, there's the challenge of having virtual meetings. Um, I, uh, I've heard some stories that these can be quite difficult to run. We're having a virtual meeting now, so they, are, they clearly can happen. Um, but uh, um, as I say, registrars, I think, slightly sort of roll their eyeballs if they're asked to, to organize that, because the technology for sorting out all that is, is still being developed, I think, so it works effectively. Um, so, that, so that's really the points I'd, I'd like to make, as I say, business continuity, impact on the portfolio, shareholder engagement, results and reporting, and, and organizing your AGM. And finally, in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with actually some words from the government. Those are stay alert. Um, the world is changing, economies are moving, markets are moving, and the rules are changing. So boards need to stay alert. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Richard. Um, that was very interesting at all sorts of levels, and I'm sure we'll get lots of questions coming from that. I'd now like to pass over to Joe. Um, Joe, the floor is yours. Morning, everyone. Hi. I, I'm just going to load up a presentation, which hopefully will work. So just give me a second. Um, there we go. Hopefully you can all see that presentation. What, what I'm planning to do is a very quick overview of what's happened year to day, obviously with a real focus on the, um, the pandemic and the impact it's had across the sector. And then just to flag a few takeaways that I've come across in terms of my discussions with boards, uh, um, which I'm sure a lot of you will be thinking about. So um, just to kick off, um, what, what has actually happened? And what I've done here is I've looked at the, it's called the FTSE Equity Investments Instruments. It's basically the investment trust sector versus the all share to look at the relative performance. Um, and you can see as we were going into the pandemic, um, sort of end of February, you could see actually investment trusts held up relatively well. And obviously what we're looking at here is effectively a UK index against um, uh, something which has got a lot of defensive assets in um, infrastructure, renewables, and you, you would expect it to hold up. But what was actually quite interesting, and this was in mid-March, so between the 15th and the 19th of March, you can't really see it on this chart, but um, at that point, the investment trust index effectively collapsed on a relative basis. So over those four days, it was down on a relative basis by 14%. Um, and I'm sure you've all looked into the, you know, the reasons why we've seen um, the fall of what was happening. There was a lot of ETF selling in the FTSE 250. There was a certain amount of retail selling, but, but not a huge amount. I mean, and Andrew can talk you through what the wealth managers were doing. Again, we didn't see an enormous amount of selling coming from there. The, the issue was much more an absence of buyers. And you ended up in a situation where certain asset classes had um, performed as you might expect them to, such as the infrastructure space it had held up well. There came a point where actually there were no buyers, there were some sellers, and there was a one-to-one -one correlation pretty much in everything. Um, since then, we have seen the rebound, and you can see here again, um, over a period of time, there is outperformance. Richard flagged the fact that volatility still continues, and we would expect that to do so. Um, and then just kind of drilling into the, the, the um, 20 largest investment companies and just coming back to that index you were looking at, this is about half of the index um, in these 20 investment companies. And you can see here, this is the performance year to date. You can see here there's quite a disparity um, in terms of the, the performance. And uh, overall, it's, it really comes down to weightings to the US, weightings to technology, 
um, and waiting to the UK. The, the bigger you're waiting to UK, and I'm looking at something like City of London and Mercantile, um, the, the, the worse your performance is going to be. And those which have got less UK exposure, uh, more tech, more healthcare, Scottish Mortgage, for example, um, obviously Polar Cap, World, Worldwide Healthcare, um, have actually held up pretty well on a performance basis. Pershing Square is a bit of an outlier because they actually took insurance against the market pre the crash. Um, and then just looking into the subsectors again, um, the, there's, there's a real disparity in terms of the overall performance. So what I've done here is looked at NAV performance and share price performance. And it, it's quite important to look at both of them. Because if you take the example of something like UK commercial property in NAV terms, actually so far, it's held up reasonably well. And obviously the reason is that there is a lag in terms of the, um, the announcements of the NAVs in terms of commercial property. And you can see how the market has priced that in with UK commercial property and things like private equity being down towards the bottom of the share price performance. But again, it's the same theme. Technology has held up well, biotech has done well. Um, and if you look at the bottom of both, you've got the UK equity income, UK small cap and UK all companies. And so obviously UK has really been affected badly during the last few months. Um, and then coming, coming back to the, the discount chart, you can see what was happening in the lead in to the um, COVID-19. Um, discounts were narrowing from kind of 5% level and actually got to their highest ever average level of about 1.1% at the start of this year. And you can see there the speed at which the discounts widened out to over 20%. Um, and, and it was really in the space of about two weeks that we saw this enormous move in terms of pricing and discounts. And it's probably worth just putting in the context of what happened at the time of the, um, the financial crisis. So this is looking back over 25 years. And you can see that going back into 2007, 8, 9, um, th there was a similar move in discounts to round about mid 20s. But you can see the time frame over which it took place. It started in um, 07 and probably hit its nadir in 08. Whereas we've seen exactly the same move in terms of overall discounts um, in a much, much shorter period. And obviously there has been a rebound as well, but it, it has been a very, very volatile time. And so looking at the sectors again what what you know we, we've talked about discounts widening we've talked about them narrowing so where are we as of now so this chart is a little bit um complicated I'll, I'll explain it so basically the vertical lines show the discount range over the last 12 months so take private equity the lowest discount of the sector as a whole has been sub 10 percent and the widest has been over 50 percent the bottom line of the of the green box shows the current discount and the top line of the green box shows the average discount for the last 12 months. So this is basically saying, where are we now? And you can see from pretty much all of these sectors that there has been a, a significant re-rating from the lows. We are still not really near the highs and actually we are still below the 12 month sector average. So I'm gonna come on to talk about kind of what that means in terms of boards and discounts and buybacks, but it is worth bearing in mind that even though we have seen an element of re-rating um, pretty much every sector, and that includes um, some of the more defensive sectors, are trading at wider discounts than their historic average or their 12-month average. Um, so that all sounds quite negative. I wanted to put a little bit of kind of good news out there, which is that issuance has continued. Um, and if you look at the numbers for March, April and May, yes, they are, they are down on where they were um, historically, but actually there are some quite healthy numbers in there. Um, what's interesting and not unexpected is obviously the IPO market has pretty much stopped for the time being. There's only been one IPO this year, which was the Nippon Active Value Fund raising just over 100 million, but that was in February pre the current crisis. Um, but since April, there has been a lot of fundraising via TAP issuance. We've seen a large secondary issuance um, by Trig raising 120 million in an over, oversubscribed secondary issuance. Um, but this year alone, we've had 1.2 billion of regular issuance from investment trusts. And you know, the top of the list are things like Worldwide Healthcare, Scottish Mortgage, Smithson, Impacts. Um, but it is ongoing, it is regular, um, and you can see here in the numbers, it's not a small amount. So the sector is still 
thriving to the extent that it um, is able to issue shares. There are a number of trusts trading at a premium. And I think our expectation is that if you look forward into June, July, August, normally there's a lull in the summer months. I think based on working conditions now and the lack of holidays, we'll probably um, find that there's going to be more issuance than you might think over those months. But as I said, the IPO market is currently closed. And then you've got the flip side of that, which is what's been happening in terms of buybacks. And you can see um, in March, but certainly in April, that the, the number of buybacks um, has been significantly reduced. And that's kind of what you would expect, because I think there were certainly points um, over that period of time where had you been in the market buying back shares, you would have really struggled to have really influenced or impacted your discount. Um, the market was, um, was too volatile and it was actually very difficult at times to work out what your actual NAV was because there was so much intraday movement in terms of share prices. But you can see here that in May, we have seen buybacks picking back up. Um, I think there are a number of boards out there that are considering what to do about their discounts. Um, and after the, um, the, the kind of hold back in April, certainly in May, we've seen boards getting a bit more active. And so another theme, again, which will be relevant to a number of you is um, dividend cuts. That has been something which has happened fairly quickly um, through March and April. And it's really been focused, as, as I show here, in terms of property REITs, um, 16 property REITs have either cut or suspended their dividends. And a lot of the other ones have announced that they are, they're keeping them under review. Um, debt and leasing, again, there have been 11 companies cutting or suspending their dividends. Again, it's all about uncertain revenues. In terms of the actual UK investment trust, so far only three have announced future dividend cuts or reviews. So that sector seems to be holding up in terms of dividends at the moment, but obviously we are still relatively early days. Um, and then if you look across the other sectors, um, it, it's been fairly quiet in terms of actual announced dividend cuts. Um, but it is interesting that there have been two infrastructure funds, GCP and Hickel, that I flag here, that have reduced their future targets. And I think this is a theme we are going to see developing over the coming months in terms of dividends, how sustainable are they, um, and which trusts can continue to pay out at historic levels. So just to wrap up, what I've done here is kind of flag three key considerations that I see um, boards needing to think about. Um, obviously, I've just talked about dividends. Um, do you maintain your dividends? Do you dip into revenue reserves? In some cases, do you pay out of capital? Um, or do you take the pain now? Do you rebase to a level that's sustainable over the medium long term? Obviously, a lot of this will come down to the asset class that you're invested in, the manager's projections um, for revenues. But obviously, one of the great advantages of the investment trust is that ability to maintain dividends uh, by dipping into reserves um, when necessary. Buybacks, again, it's a very difficult debate. Do you use buybacks? Markets are still very volatile. We've seen um, price moving around today. Do you go into the markets to try and minimize your discount volatility or do you step back? Um, I don't think there's necessarily a right answer, but it's certainly a very live consideration for a number of boards. And then the final point, which is something I think Richard alluded to, is, um, is performance. And you saw earlier in the charts in terms of the top, just the top 20 investment trusts, that there's quite a disparity in terms of performance. Um, and because there've been such um, changes over the last three months in terms of NAV performance, um, that can really impact the long-term performance of the trusts, even though it impacting the three-year and five-year numbers. And it, it's, it's quite a difficult one to, to judge how your manager has performed over this period of time, because obviously, um, it was very difficult to predict the pandemic. I'm not sure anyone would put their hand up and say they managed to predict it. Um, and so has performance, good or bad, has it been influenced by luck, bad luck? Um, and then the question is, given that um, this all happened very quickly, how have your managers reacted? Have they repositioned the portfolio? Have they taken views in terms of where things are going to go? Um, and the final question I've got here is on this point is, um, Investment trusts have got a number of tools available to them that other funds do not have. The ability to be fully invested in downturns, the ability um, to use gearing um, in the upturns, are these being fully utilised? And obviously, again, I'm sure all of you directors will have been thinking about this, but it, it will be an interesting time over the next couple of years to see who the winners and losers have been. I think it's far too soon to, to predict. 
Um, but I think from a performance perspective, it is certainly true that the last few months will have a disproportionate impact on a number of managers' performance. Um, so that's me. And um, I think those are the three, at the moment, the three key takeaways I'll leave you with. Thank you very much, Joe. And now we'll pass across to our last speaker, um, Andrew, and then after Andrew's session, we'll start taking some questions. We do have a few coming through already, so do please feel free to, to ask away um, throughout. Andrew. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, let me just make sure I'm um, sharing my screen uh, with you all. Uh, Susan, can you see that? Not yet. Okay, apologies all. Let me try again. Share screen. Okay, it's coming up now. Uh, are we good? Yep. Thank you all. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I'd like to focus today on um, a very important part of your role as directors, which both Richard and Joe actually touched on, and that's really using the current situation to gain an insight into the investment proposition of the investment trust. You don't need me to, to tell you that one of the principal responsibilities uh, of an NAD is to ensure that the investment objective of the trust is being met. Um, and that manifests itself through your ability to appoint uh, and to have ongoing confidence in the investment manager. And I know Richard uh, and Joe talked about many other things that are gonna be on your mind at the moment in terms of day-to-day -day practicalities of running and overseeing an investment trust. But from an investor's perspective, we really do believe that the principal role of the board of directors is to oversee the investment proposition. And that is something that I think COVID-19 will uh, furnish their boards with a huge amount of opportunity and information to really help them understand even more the investment strengths and weaknesses of the investment trust. And that's because boards are uniquely placed with your access to management. As investors, we try and we do get good access to management. But even if I own 10% of a trust, and I lose confidence in the investment proposition, you know, at worst, the share price will go down a bit. Um, if you lose confidence in an investment manager, that investment manager loses 100% of those assets. And so you as directors are hugely powerful. Uh, and that I believe should always be reflected in the knowledge and the insight that you as boards have regarding the investment proposition. Now, COVID-19 has created an opportunity to enhance even further that understanding. The conversations I've had with managers, regardless of the asset class or the strategy, has proven to us that uh, they have reviewed every position, they have reassessed every assumption in every model, and that may or may not have resulted in turnover, but clearly there has been a huge amount of activity and thinking that should, over time, lead to outperformance. And the question I would pose to boards is, can you utilize and leverage this huge additional swathe of information that you are getting from your investment managers in terms of thinking and insight and activity to really try and identify what the strengths and weaknesses of the investment proposition are? And to use a tried and tested framework for doing that, um, we can say that the philosophy, the process, the people, and the parent company have all been tested. Did the philosophy work? Does the philosophy work? Will the philosophy work? Hopefully the answer will be yes. Even for those strategies that look the most beaten up right now and are owning assets that are being ditched left, right, and center, Maybe you will realize that actually the strategy is wrong. 
we are only at the early stages of COVID-19 and many of us are only at the point of speculating what permanent or medium term changes COVID-19 might have on investment markets. But it is definitely something that I feel boards should be thinking about. Did the process pass the test? Processes which require inputs on earnings projections or power prices or rental streams or defaults, whatever it is. Processes have been shaken to the core with a lack of information and a lack of historical or precedent for investment managers to use. Has the process passed the test? And have the people passed the test? How have they coped? Some may leave, some may give up, some may not want to do the commute anymore. Some may have stress, some may see little promotion in the future. Some may see prospects for uh, making a lot of money um, disappearing before their eyes. What does that mean to the talent that your investment management proposition has? And then finally, has the investment management company passed the test? Have they committed to you the resources that you feel the investment proposition needs? I'm sure a lot of asset management companies will be under P&L pressure in the years ahead. What does that mean for the proposition and the resources that your investment trust has access to? Have they been supportive of personnel? Have they provided the infrastructure? And will they provide the remuneration or whatever else it is that you feel personnel need to remain happy and motivated and therefore generating what we hope is outperformance? And then, therefore, I feel that boards and investors really should always be asking the same sort of questions, really, because we're all essentially doing real time ongoing due diligence on investment managers. What strengths and weaknesses has this period exhibited in the investment offering? If it hasn't worked, is that forever? Is it temporary? Is a fund manager stuck in his or her ways? Is that discipline, which we like, or is it denial, which we don't like? It's a fine line. What changes might this bring to philosophy process people in the parent company? I don't think any of us are expecting any knee jerk reactions. But we also need to be honest. And the point I'm making is there is lots and lots of material, rich material now for boards to use to help answer those questions. Joe very, very uh, uh, correctly pointed out the question of performance. A lot of past performance over the last three months will have been driven a lot by luck. If you were positioned going into COVID-19, risk on, geared, cyclical, that might have been perfectly acceptable given the macroeconomic circumstances that the fund manager felt was in place in February, but it would have led to shocking relative performance. How do you decide what performance was bad luck and can be forgiven, and what relative performance actually is a sign of failure and mistake at, at which might persist and therefore cause problems for the future? There will be new challenges, travel, budgets, working from home. How will that impact investment teams? And crises typically lead to big challenges. I believe there'll be huge corporate change uh, in all countries. Investment trusts should not be let out of that. It is inconceivable to me that all investment propositions will come out of COVID-19 smelling of roses. Will boards have the courage to recognize where things have gone wrong and make the necessary changes. And finally, fortune favors the brave. Uh, there will be a lot of, there is a lot of radical thinking that boards can do to take advantage of this situation. Rob has mentioned, sorry, Joe has mentioned the point about um, the need for income. Uh, we are seeing companies raising equity at discounts to NAV hitherto a no-no, but actually, if that equity can be raised and reinvested um, on very, very favorable terms, maybe, maybe that's something that boards should consider. Mergers and acquisitions, struggling trusts, renegotiating debt, uh, innovative um, balance sheet um, transactions, all the sorts of things that we should be expecting boards to consider. So in summary, never let a serious crisis go to waste. That's me. Thank you.
Many thanks, Andrew. Well, without further ado, um, let's go straight to questions. So we've actually got a few coming up from the audience. So we'll try and work our way through as many of these as we can. I'm actually going to take a couple together. Um, so Wendy Dory asked, what is the panel's view on issuing C shares to raise new cash? And David Potter asked, why do investment trusts only issue new shares at a premium? Suspect that might be a good one for you, Joe. Um I'll, I'll take I'll take the second one first. So the, the reason reason for issuing at a premium is it's long standing and it's effectively to avoid NAV dilution for those who don't participate. Now there have been instances, and again I'm thinking back to 2008, where particularly some of the private equity funds did what we think of as effectively discounted rights issues um, at a discount. You need your shareholder approval to do that. So it is possible. So I, I, to answer the question, it's more of a an established procedure, um, it, and I, I actually quite like Andrew to comment. If you know, if if the um, investors of this world were happy to take shares at a discount or to participate in a rights issue on the ground that there there were opportunities around, then yes, that could happen. Um, so there's no there's no intrinsic reason why it couldn't. It's much more um, a convention than anything else. But Andrew, maybe you should just quickly comment on that. Yeah, I can. I mean, I think historically we've been very uh, reluctant to um, see shares being issued at a discount to NAV because, as, as Joe pointed out, um, if you don't take up um, if you don't take up those rights, then um, you'll be diluted. And it, those kind of those kind of trades tend to favor, favor institutional investors who probably do have the cash to move around and actually take advantage of these opportunities. But you know the proverbial Mrs. Miggins probably doesn't. So it's, it, it represents a transfer of wealth, frankly, from small retail investors that we care about to the big institutional investors that can participate. Having said that, uh, we have seen a number of situations in the last 12 months where companies have come to us and said, look, our share price doesn't really lend itself to raising equity because it's at a discount. It's a, let's say a 10% discount to NAV. But we can buy assets that we believe are so cheap that even if your investor does not participate in the equity raise, they will be better off as a result of this transaction. And you can actually make the investment manager do the maths for you. It's relatively straightforward maths to say, prove to me that if I'm diluted by 10%, that the assets you bought are so favorable that on a three year view, if you're right, um, I will still be better off than if the transaction hadn't taken place. If that is the case, um, and it won't always be the case, and it might rarely be the case, but when it is the case, we will be ready to listen. Yeah, and just, sorry, just to pick up on the, the first question, which was, I think was, um, should boards consider issuing C shares? I think if, if there is, it's, it's a similar answer, to be honest. I think if there is an investment opportunity um, and the, the managers can put forward a strong reason why new capital now um, will be attractive, then I think the answer is yes, absolutely. I think the difficulty is if your ordinary shares are trading at a discount, then the, the, the question might be, well, why would I buy C's versus boards at a discount? And if your ordinary shares are at a premium, you might have the debate in terms of whether to just, as I was talking about earlier, to tap out into the market. It obviously depends on the asset class, but I think the answer is, it's a question for the managers and it's almost a sales pitch. If they have got a, a, a really good opportunity set and they can convince people that they should be putting more capital to work, then we have seen, as I said, you know, 1.2 billion raised in terms of tap issuance. There's no reason you couldn't do that by c -shares. Right. Now, mo moving on to Sarah Godfrey asked a question on buybacks. Um, do the panel feel that trying to limit the discount in the face of abnormal market conditions goes in the face of one of the advantages of the closed end structure, i.e. the ability for the manager to continue to focus on the portfolio without having to worry about selling liquid holdings to meet outflows? Volunteer to take that one on. I'll, I'll, I'll kick off and be interesting to get um, thoughts of the other panel. Yeah, I think... <laughs> I think I think there's a balancing act. I think to, to answer the first question, trying trying to um, engage in active share buybacks in volatile markets, to me is very difficult because whatever good you may do in terms of um, buying back shares, it, everything might get wiped out by the the actual price movement in terms of your stock. I, I think I think that there is there's a real balance here. I think it's it's a it's it's a valid point to say ultimately one of the great advantages of investment trusts is that they're not for sellers. I think in the context of buybacks, we're not typically talking about enormous amounts. 
Um, so I think there is an argument to say that in less volatile markets, you may see more bang for your buck in terms of buying back shares um, than hanging on to those investments potentially. Um, but it is also true that when, when you have got um, significant selling pressure, trying to stand in the way of that, um, all you will do is shrink the trust, you will force your manager to liquidate assets, and you won't necess necessarily see the benefit. So, sorry, it's a very wishy-washy answer to say it, it depends, um, but it genuinely does depend. And I would say, in general, the more volatile the market, the less I would encourage boards to buy back shares. Thank you. Um, can we change the subject a little? We've had a question coming through, which is interesting in a slightly different dimension. Um, someone asking what the impact might be on board composition and profile. Should boards look for different people than the ones who are on current boards? And what kind of characteristics might be important in this new environment we're all talking about? Richard, can we kick off with you? Yes, certainly. Um, I, I think a board should be looking regularly at its composition and saying, are we fit for purpose? So, you know, a good board will have a succession plan. It will be carrying out annual reviews of the board and saying, looking at where we are now, do we have the right combination of skills? Do we have the right important matters actually like diversity and things? So I think, you know, boards need to be aware all the time that they're not there for life. They've got to have a reason to be there. And I think, you know, importantly now, all directors come up for, for, for re-election and, you have to set out why you think they should be re-elected. So there is an opportunity for shareholders to, if you like, let their views know. But part of that process, part of putting yourself forward again, is actually just looking and saying, do we need to change? And I think, you know, board should change if that's the case. Thank you, Richard. In the interest of trying to cover quite a few of the questions coming through, and I'm very conscious about time here, let me just throw another one into the pot. Um, this is a question from Derek Scott. Just as governments have been challenged for being too late, how many investment managers have been complacent, failing to learn lessons from past pandemics or epidemics? Andrew, would you like to take that one? Sure. Um, I think the, the sort of the flippant but genuine answer would be it's probably too early to tell. But one thing that we've been really, really struck by is almost regardless of the strategy, investment managers have actually made relatively few decisions in the last few months. Um, and you either take that as a as a as a sign of reassurance um, that they weren't invested in stuff that they think is going to go completely uh, to pot, or more likely, in the case of sort of more value orientated managers, they probably were in stuff that share prices had fallen so much that they didn't really have time to get out before it was too late. Um, I actually don't blame investment managers for that. I think that sort of frantic trading in the first couple of days. Of this with markets falling 10 15 20 25 30 percent is re rarely a good idea i think what's much more interesting from now is how they will deploy capital going forward uh, my assumption is that investment managers will have got rid of anything that's truly terrible and damaging and dangerous in the portfolio and hopefully that would be relatively would have resulted in relatively little trading but from here uh, i would expect on a on a three six nine month view um, quite large portions of capital to be redeployed um, and if they get that right, or if they get a good hit rate right, uh, on a three to five year view, that will generate more than enough relative alpha to overcome any sort of bad luck that they might have had in terms of the positioning that came into the portfolio when they came into COVID. But you have to take a long term view. And that's what's crucial. Thank you, Andrew. Richard, have you anything to add to that one? Richard, do you want to pop your... Sorry, I'm on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. As I say, you still get used to these habits. We're still getting used to virtual meetings. Um, no, I think Andrew summed it up well. I think, you know, the, if you look back, um, we haven't had many pandemics. The world did take a shock in March. Um, if you look across the world, most people were surprised. Um, I think the important thing is investment managers have stuck to what their policy is that they've done that and they've adjusted appropriately within the constraints that they have. Thank you. Now, I know we have lots more questions, but I'm also really conscious of time and it's always a good thing, I guess, to, uh, to leave you wanting a little bit more. So perhaps you might come along to the next seminar. 
um, that we run, which I think will probably take quite a few of these topics and explore them in a little bit more detail. But before we finish, perhaps I can just ask each of the speakers to perhaps just give us a bit of a soundbite in terms of what they think is the most important point um, that they would like to leave you with. Uh, Joe, do you want to kick off? Uh, yes, and it's interesting because um, having seen some of the Q&A questions coming through, I think the, um, I, I'll go back to the, the, the themes that I flagged, but I think income is going to be a key theme over the coming years. So, um, so obviously performance is going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out, but I think income is going to be really important and boards are going to have to make decisions about how much to dip into reserves, um, whether to rebase, um, and importantly, whether to continue to pay out of capital. And I think we're going to see a lot more um, trust coming up with quite interesting ways of preserving income. Thank you. Richard? Um, well, I think we've had the shape of any recovery described in all sorts of different ways. It's V-shaped, it's the square root shape or whatever. I think that just says the world's uncertain. And so I'd like to leave people with the short two words I used earlier on. Boards need to stay alert. Thank you, Richard. And finally, Andrew. Thank you. I mean, I think also, as Joe mentioned, looking at some of the questions, there's a lot of emphasis on income, but also on how to manage discounts and discount volatility. And I think the same principle applies to both of that, how to deal with both of those, which is for the boards to work very closely with the investment manager. Um, uh, you know, discount control mechanisms uh, should be um, should be uh, should be agreed between the board and with and the manager to make sure that um, what what is done is in the right interest of shareholders um, in terms of long-term performance not short-term trying to get the share price up and likewise with income uh, there will be lots of opportunities going forward UK UK dividends across the market are probably going to not recover for many 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 years so there's a huge hole in the income of many many client portfolios which requires innovative thinking which again, if the manager and the boards work together, uh, we could see some quite interesting stuff in the months and years ahead. Thank you, Andrew. Um, well, finally, I guess just to thank our three speakers, um, that's been hugely informative and very interesting. And, and thank you on behalf of, I'm sure, all the audience. Um, and thank you, audience, for obviously attending the webinar. We hope you'll join us at our next one as well. And we'd be very delighted to hear your feedback on any of the topics we've covered today, or indeed any areas that you might like to hear more about going forward. So please do let us know and we'd be delighted to take you up on it. Thank you very much again and enjoy the rest of your day. Many thanks. Bye bye.